We're in the second uh, week of a series that started actually on Easter Sunday, so I guess the third week, uh, that we're calling One for All and All for One. The idea is that Christ Jesus died for all so that now all live for Him. What does that life look like? What does it mean to live, amen, in the life that Christ gives to us? The scripture for today is the book of Philippians in the first chapter. The people of Philippi are very dear to Paul's heart, and um, they're not quite getting it. They're not quite living the life that he has taught them about. And so he writes them this letter to sort of remind them of what the gospel is all about. I'm going to read a section in the first chapter, picking it up with verse 21. Paul writes this, For to me, living is Christ. And dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the sake of the gospel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it is a national holiday today. I don't know how many of you uh, are aware of it, so I will undertake as my personal agenda for the day to make you aware of the nature of this holiday. It is International Star Wars Day today. If you are not aware, consider the date, May the 4th, which allows you to greet one another with the traditional Star Wars Day greeting, May the 4th be with you. As you also know, as church people, the correct liturgical response to that is, and also with you. Now, dressing in costume is optional for today, but I do appreciate <laughs> that. Um, can you just pan over here real quick, Chad, and, uh, and show the YouTube video crowd that we do have costumed participants in the service today? I believe that person as a doctor. I just, I think, okay, that's good. I did not know that was going to happen. You can, you can sit there the whole, you can wear it, you can take it off. I mean, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <clears throat> it's, I am a Star Wars fan. If you know me, you know that about me. I was, I was an adolescent when the Star Wars movies came out, and so they were very made a big impression on me, the, the, the very beginning of the movie, from the, from the initial moments of the movie, when it's that dark screen and the blue words come up on the screen. If you're a fan, you know what the blue words said, long ago, in a galaxy far, and then there's dot, 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 long ago in a galaxy far, and then there's dot, 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 What's going to happen? It just leaves you like, oh, this is going to be good. Right away. I mean, right away you knew. And then John Williams. And the words are scrolling across and you can't even read them. They're going so fast. And then there's the laser beams are coming. What is happening? And then there's this gigantic imperial cruiser that comes over and there's stormtroopers and Darth Vader walks in. Oh, I mean, right away you just get sucked into this universe that is, I mean, it's beautiful. It's an absolutely amazing, so many powerful moments. The, I mean, Darth Vader's initial appearance when it's just like coming out of the fog and he walks in and you're like, 
totally terrified. Still, by the way, never has been, never will be a better movie villain than Darth Vader. I am still, to this day, scared of, <laughs> of Darth Vader's mask. And then, and then there's, there's just moment after moment, they, they blow up an entire planet. My goodness, who would have thought? They blow up the whole planet, leading Ben Kenobi, who's like three solar systems away, reeling, as he says, I have sensed a great disturbance in the force. The force? What's that? Oh, that sounds cool. I want to know more about what that is. Moment after moment, the Millennium Falcon flying in at the last minute and allowing Luke to blow up the Death Star. And it wasn't over. I mean, there's more after that. Come on, the Battle of Hoth? Are you kidding me? An at-at? <gasps> I've never seen anything like that before. It's amazing. So many moments, so many wonderful things. But, of course, there's the moment. You know, there is the there's very little disagreement about the moment of Star Wars. You know it when Luke is battling Darth Vader. Luke's injured. He's, he's at, a, you know, at the end of his rope. He's way out at the end of this bridge, literally, over this great huge abyss. Darth Vader has the upper hand. And Luke says, I know what happened to my father. You killed my father. And then uh, the line that changes everything. No, I am your father. Ah, what just happened? There's no, what is, uh, this is, what? No way, no way. <laughs> if that movie came out today, there's, by the way, no way that stays a secret after opening night. Holy cow, he's tweeting, Darth Vader's Luke's father, did you know? Spoiler alert. What a powerful moment. Luke is absolutely devastated by this news. So devastated that he actually leaps into the abyss. Don't worry, there's a sequel, so they save him. I mean, he doesn't die. There has to be another movie. So, so he's saved. But, but Luke is just absolutely devastated and destroyed. This, this one that he thought was so evil. I mean, the face of evil, the absolute embodiment of the dark side is his father. I love Luke. Oh, I love Luke's journey. He's my favorite character in the whole series. Luke's reluctance at the beginning, his struggle I mean, he's supposed to be something else. He knows it, too. He's supposed to do something else. He's supposed to be bigger than he is just working on his uncle's farm. He doesn't know what, but he's got this sense of call, this sense that, that he's destined for more, and he struggles with it, and he works on it, and he discerns, and, and he even has this opportunity to start to follow this call, to be a part of this rebel alliance that's fighting against the evil empire. But still, it's an abstract idea for him. It's, it's not concrete until the empire attacks his family's farm and kills his aunt and uncle. Then it's personal. Then, for Luke, this calling has a personal connection. It's no longer just an idea. It's something that has hit him right in the heart. And so he follows that call. He follows that call to become a guardian of peace and justice in the universe to become a Jedi Knight. And he works through the ways of the Force and he learns from Yoda what it means to be a Jedi, to pursue evil, to pursue Darth Vader, to, to, to struggle against this one, and then to learn, huh, and then to learn that all along it's his father, it's Anakin, it's... It's this one that he knows. It's a personal connection. From that moment on, from that, no, I am your father. From then on, Luke's journey is one not to defeat Darth Vader, but to redeem him. He no longer wants to destroy him. He wants to reconcile with him. And he's the only one that does. Everyone else around him has written Vader off. He's evil. He's, he's so saturated with the dark side that there's no hope for him. Luke doesn't buy it. He believes there is good in him yet. And everything that he does is motivated by the desire to reach beyond that mask, reach into that darkness, and redeem his father. 
to redeem, to reconcile. Everything that Luke does is motivated by this desire to redeem somebody who doesn't want to be redeemed. Everything he does at this point on is motivated by the desire to love someone who doesn't want to be loved, to reconcile with someone who doesn't want to be reconciled. Everything that he does for the rest of the story is for the sake of Anakin, a life lived for someone else's sake. Does that sound familiar to anyone? A life that is given away for the sake of someone else, someone else who might not necessarily want it. A love that is shown for people who might not necessarily want to be loved. Love that is given to people who may very well be categorized as unlovable. Jesus lived his life not for himself. Jesus lived his life for others. Everything he did, motivated by love for others. Jesus also calls his followers to live that same way, motivated not by our own comfort, not by our own ambitions, motivated by care for others, concern for others. We are to live our lives for the sake of others as well. This is the challenge that Paul himself was struggling with when he wrote the letter to the Philippians. As he wrote to these people, he is not writing to an abstract idea. He is not writing to, to try to articulate a systemic, uh, systematic theology. He is writing to some people that he knows. This is a personal calling for Paul. He loves Philippi. There is a deep and abiding connection here. We read in Acts chapter 16 that he taught there that Philippi is where he met Lydia. He stayed in Lydia's home, that Lydia's home may very well have been the very first church there in Philippi. It is in Philippi where we read about the exorcism of the slave girl, which led to his imprisonment. And while Paul is in prison, we read about that great earthquake that shook the jail and opened the doors, and yet Paul remained. And that conversation that happened with his jailer that led to his jailer's conversion and living for Christ. Paul has a history here in Philippi, and they're not getting it. They're not hearing the message. They're not living the life that he has described to them, and so he writes this letter. He writes this letter, first of all, to convince them of how important this is. He puts it in terms of life and death. Quite simply, I don't know if you caught it as I read it before. If not, take a moment and read chapter 1 again. Quite simply, Paul says, you know, I could just die and go and be with Jesus. That would be better for me. That would be wonderful, as a matter of fact. Or I could stay here and live for you because you need help. You need the help that I can offer. And so rather than die, I'm choosing to live. I'm making a conscious choice this day to stay here with you because you need help. And it is a specific kind of help that I can offer you. And as I offer you that help, I want you to know how important it is that I follow this call. It's a matter of life and death. It's very stark. It's very jarring when Paul puts it in those terms. If we take out that element of death and say it a different way, it, it's a little less difficult to hear, but the meaning is still the same. Because what Paul is saying is, I could live my life motivated by my own spiritual needs, or I could live my life motivated by what you need and do all that I can to help you. I'm choosing the second option. I want you to know that I am choosing to suffer for you, that I'm choosing imprisonment for you, that I'm choosing persecution for you. Paul makes a conscious decision to place someone else's needs ahead of his own. 
Luke Skywalker as well. He is Luke Skywalker, making a conscious decision to live his life for someone else's sake. Both of them share a personal stake in the outcome. It is not an abstract idea. It is an incarnate, enfleshed, embodied reality to follow this call. Now, Luke succeeds in his. Luke struggles and fights, but he succeeds in the conversion of Anakin Skywalker. He reconciles Anakin so that at the very end, this masked villain works to end evil once and for all in the universe. Well, until episode 7 comes out in a couple of years, then I understand some other evil comes to be. His last act in this life is to destroy the emperor. He has struggled with Luke. He has done battle, literally physical battle with Luke during this intense and emotional, emotional fight. And finally has come to realize the kind of life that he has been living. And how, how distant that life is from where he should be. He has finally realized that he has been living within himself, and ultimately the mask comes off, and he lives for Luke's sake. This costs Luke a great deal. It costs him his, his health. It costs him his stamina. He is at the very bottom of his barrel. He has tied a knot in the end of the rope and is hanging on for dear life, begging and pleading. And finally, conversion. Finally, at the very end, a moment of clarity in which Vader realizes what he has become. He realizes what Luke has done for him. And his final action is truly worthy. It is a worthy action, worthy of what it means to be a guardian of peace and justice. So Paul's hope is that his efforts will also have similar results that the lives of the Philippians will be lived in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. He lays it out for them and tells them, this is important, this is big stuff, this is a matter of life and death. Now, let me tell you what you can do for me. Live a life worthy of the gospel. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life is actually a Greek word that translates as be a citizen. So be a part of a community. Be a part of a connection. This is not a life that is to be lived in isolation. He's not speaking to an individual saying live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus. He's speaking to a community. Live a life together. A life that is worthy of the gospel you here right now, connected to one another as the body of Christ, you are a part of something that is bigger than you, bigger than even the sum of our parts. We are a part of the body of Christ when we share in worship together, in community together. The life we are called to live is a life that is supposed to be lived together, connected to one another when you're not here at a worship service, it makes a difference. Oh, sure, it makes a difference for you. It makes a difference because you're not living as healthy a discipleship as you personally could live. But there's another reason it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference to the body of Christ. When the body is not fully present, the body as a whole suffers. We are supposed to do this thing together. We live this life together. It is not an individual life that we live. Our individual lives are a part of Christ. And as Christ is revealed in the world, our true identity comes to life, and we live together as the church. In the next chapter, Paul explains more about what he means by that. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete, he says. Be of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord and in one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. This radical kind of unity as the body of Christ is a prevalent theme throughout the entire New Testament, as in Ephesians chapter 4, where we read, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. As a part of the church, as a member of the body of Christ, for whom are you living? Honestly, be completely truthful and transparent with yourself. God already knows for whom are you living? English teachers in the room, I know you'll appreciate that grammar. I worked really hard to figure that one out. For whom are you living? Are you living for those close to you? Are you living for people who already kind of like you? That's great. Are you loving those who love you? It's fine. It's fine. I am living for others. Yes, I'm living for my children. I'm living for my parents. I'm living for my family. I'm living for my friends. That's great. It's wonderful. Pre apologies for what I'm about to say. There's nothing particularly Christian about that. Everybody does that. Jesus himself said it. You love people who love you anyway, that's wonderful, but everybody does that. It doesn't matter what faith you hold, or if you hold no faith at all, we tend to love people who love us. No, what Jesus wants from us is to love people who don't. Is to love people who won't. To love people who are unlovable. To give to people who will not say thank you. To live our lives for strangers, for enemies even. To live our lives in such a way that the gospel of Jesus Christ is glorified. The grace of Jesus Christ is introduced into somebody's life who desperately needs to hear it. For whom are you living? Are we living lives worthy of this gospel? This gospel of this man who lived his life for a world that was going to be ungrateful, wasn't going to say thank you. A man who loved and did everything that he did, motivated by that love, love for others, always, always love for others. Is our life worthy of that, worthy of that gospel, worthy of that calling? Ah, whew, man, that's big. That is big. How in the world can we possibly, no, no. It's too much. It's overwhelming. Remember last week, these sermons build on each other. Last week when we talked about, man, the life that you're given, this is given to you because God already thinks you're worthy. <laughs> God loves you no matter what. God thinks you're important. God thinks you matter. And it's because of your worthiness to God that you are given this gospel life. Now, go and live it. Go and share it. And be encouraged, as Paul writes, be encouraged by the love of Christ. The love of Christ urges us on. 
For we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died as he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves but for him who died and was raised for them. One for all. Now all for one. Live a life that is worthy of this gospel. And remember, living worthy does not mean being perfect. It doesn't mean that you're getting it right all the time, that you're never going to make a mistake. Living worthy means that you don't let those mistakes devastate you. Living worthy means that you are keeping God at the center of your priorities and living your life accordingly. Living worthy means that you have as your goal the selfless love of Jesus. And even if you aren't quite there yet, you are looking for a way to get there. You are looking for space in which to grow towards that goal. And sometimes we get it. I mean, the church is that space. The church is that way. As we help one another live this life, as we live this life together, that's what we do. It's our mission. And sometimes we're almost there. Sometimes we can sense it. We can feel it. It's like we just take one more step. We will be fully embraced by this amazing and joyous Holy Spirit. We almost have it. Let's just go a little bit closer. But, you know, sometimes we are so far away. We are so deep in despair from time to time that we think we're never going to get it. And it is precisely at those moments that we lean on one another, that we encourage one another, and that we manage to take the next step. God has given us time and space in which we can figure out who we really are as individual members of the body of Christ. So look for that space to find out who, in fact, we are. Experience. I'm trying to find my own way. Sometimes I wish that I could fly away. When I think that I'm moving, suddenly things stand still. And I'm afraid because I think. in the sunshine and my dreams and I'm looking for space and to find out who I am and I'm looking to know and understand
experience join in the living day if there's an answer it's just that it's just that way Yeah, thanks. So, you know, start with Star Wars, end with John Denver, right? It's an Andy Bryan sermon all the way, <laughs> all the way through. But it's true. I mean, we are given space. We are given um, one another. We are sacred space for one another in which we can try to live this life, this life that is worthy of what Christ did for us, unified in the Spirit, unified in love, unified in the grace of God, and doing all that we can to live our lives not for ourselves and our own motivations, but for one another, for the world, introducing grace and love for unlovable people, for those who might not even know they need it, ambassadors for Christ in a broken and hurting world, living the life worthy of the gospel. Can you pray with me, please? Holy God, when, when you are revealed in this world, our true selves are revealed. We know who we are because we know who you are. And so, God, our prayer is that you will help us to live together as the church, to lean on one another, to support one another, to encourage one another on the way, to live this life not for ourselves, but for the world, a world that you so passionately love, oh God. May we truly be the church you want us to be. Amen.